Um, Jam, G Grand Egyptian Museum. Um, the project for the museum is actually is about two kilometers fr um, from the pyramids, and it is effectively it's Egypt's national uh, museum. Amongst other things, it actually contains a solar boat, but it will house the, the full Tutankhamen, Tutankhamen collection when, when, when it does open sometime in about 2012, 2013, 2014, 15, 16. Um, what we first know is actually, it's, there's some, uh, the conservation's already done, it's in the back. Um, what was interesting when we first started the project, we found this image on the internet, and what, what struck us was that the, pyra the pyramids are actually not isolated, but they're actually completely within the city itself, that it, there is an incredible um, uh, juxtaposition within the, the space of the, the Nile Valley or Cairo itself and that of the desert. And it was this juxtaposition that actually started the, the project. The fact that the, the antiquity, which is represented by the pyramids, and modernity, which is represented by modern-day Cairo, and somehow how do we do basically um, uh, um, uh, kind of capture that within the project? Uh, another condition um, with, within Egypt is that Egypt, uh, in many ways, even though we know it with all the artifacts and the masks and so forth, is actually, the, Egypt is about the Nile. When we first went to Egypt and we made a presentation to the minister, he said, you Westerners, you think all Egypt is about is about sand. We actually hate the sand. In fact, Egypt is more about the green, and um, maybe you can try to do something about that. So we went back to our drawing board, and um, at this point, we engaged uh, West 8, who saved the day. Um, the project is, one third of the project is actually the building. We created an infrastructure that overlaid on the entirety of the site. But what's important is that the, the kind of this Nile or infrastructure was, uh, was very important to the Egyptians and is really the kind of this, this condition that allowed Egypt to, to kind of prosper and create a society that would create the, 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 the artifacts. And, um, and what somehow was that, that we were trying, what the, what the gardens would do, which actually occupy 60% of the site, we hope that the gardens would somehow tell a story or an exhibition of Egypt, of the lands itself, and that somehow with that seen in conjunction with the museum together would actually full, form the full experience of the Egyptian museum. The gardens also would be something that would be used um, very much during the, above, every day within the community uh, as a park. So here you can see this kind of juxtaposition, which is an extreme condition within Egypt. The Nile Valley at the lower level, which is extremely lush, extremely green, if not greener than Ireland, and the Desert Plateau, which is what most of us know of Egypt, which is about 20 to 30, 25 stories high. It's a plateau that exists substantially above the Nile Valley. And, it, and it's, it's this kind of sharp juxtaposition between desert of the dry afterlife versus the green life that, that, that uh, West Day tried to capture within the gardens. Here you can begin to see the sectional condition and also the green versus the desert. What's interesting about it is that the site is actually uh, well, very, there's the pyramids on this side. It's extremely well selected. It's selected at a point where the Nile Valley actually hits the desert, desert plateau. So this, con this very important symbolic as well as geographical condition is very much captured with, with, within just the selection of the site itself. So here you can see the Nile, uh, the flood plains that would go all the way out to the desert plateau and the desert plateau, which is where the pyramids are built on, which is about 60 to 70 meters above the Nile Valley. So the, when we started the project, this yellow line actually indicates this, uh, this, this so-called uh, condition where the Nile Valley hits the desert plateau. And this condition actually goes right through the middle of the site, uh, which is actually calling this thing a structural problem because we actually have a fault line through the middle, so the engineers are a bit frustrated. Um, the, the, uh, so there's a giant retaining wall, there's a lot of movement joints and so forth. Um, the building's moving all over the place. So the, the first thing we tried to do was somehow make that condition extremely significant. So the first thing is that that kind of cliff face, we effectively architecturalized that cliff face. And that cliff face in section was designed in such a way that from the site itself, it actually struck a line so that it connected to, to the top of the pyramids. And that effectively forms the profile of that wall. That wall stretches the entirety of the site. It's a translucent stone wall and it runs over half a mile and it's about 25 stories high. So it runs from a here, which is about 20 stories high, to about here, which is about two stories high, and it runs a little bit over half a mile. 
And in some ways, this was a kind of this was effectively the image of the building, the iconic symbolic image of the building. And so it also effectively highlighted this condition where the Nile Valley would come up dead against the building, and would basically and the uppermost level would would be the desert plateau, and the building would actually um, mediate between these two conditions. As part of the overall master plan, this is another drawing by West Aid, is that it, it, we saw the building not just with, be, this is another World Heritage Site, um, it, not just that the building would be within the World Heritage Site, well, actually the pyramids are within the UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the idea was to create an esplanade that would connect the building all the way to the pyramids and simultaneously take UNESCO's site to wrap the building itself, forming an overall structure that would actually bring all the way us one out, all the way out to Saqqara, which are another you know, series of pyramids. Origin. Um, so this is showing the delta, which is uh, what we thought was interesting. In some ways, inspired some of the building was was that this idea that as the Nile basically hits the Mediterranean, the line, the original singular line that would form the the Nile would actually expand and form tributaries, and these lines would effectively form space and fields, and and in similar ways, the building actually tries to capture this kind of structuring principle to create space. So very simply, at the uppermost level, the, the site itself, which is about a half a mile by half a mile, the pyramids. So we started by creating this line between the site and the, and the pyramids. So this architecturalizes the cliff face. And like a, I guess like a Chinese fan, it actually unfolds to capture all three pyramids within the space of the, the museum. And one of Mubarak's that was interesting about the, the project was what well, was interesting that he said it was the only scheme that actually, from, the, from the, anywhere in the museum, you can actually see the pyramids. If we actually zoom in, you can see a series of horizontal lines that this is a kind of, um, um, this is a museum of archeological, archeology span was important to um, basically uh, inscribe time into that. And across the site, which is within the axes, this is a line to the, uh, the pyramids themselves, which is the east west axes. These lines are inscribed over the entirety of the site, which actually form the, the the chronological bands that would describe the, the spaces along the entirety of the landscape. And the blue is actually in the Nile Park as it zigzags across the, 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 the site and would have effectively connect between inside and outside. And the building itself would actually be um, inscribed within the space of the lines that would fan out to capture all three pyramids. The lines that fan out actually are the primary structure lines that would actually hold up the roof, so eventually hold up the roof. And uh, the two cones of vision, the one show in this direction would be a view from the upper plateau to Cairo and here to the pyramids. Here again showing the cone of vision, one on the edge described by the largest of the pyramids and the one on the right described by the smallest of the pyramids. And the museum is actually captured within that total cone of vision. On the right hand side here you can see the desert plateau which is plus 60 meters, about 20 stories. On this side would be the desert, uh, the Nile Valley, which is at the lower level. Infrastructure. So what was interesting is that to, one of the things that the Egyptians very much understood was that the Nile was a very um, important piece of infrastructure and allowed them to control 99% of the land by effectively controlling less than 1% of the actual area. The Nile water was extremely regulated at different gates along the entirety of the Nile and also inland. So the, basically all the government did was control the Nile and the gates and they effectively were able to form taxation systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that was the, really the kind of primary element that, that actually allowed Egypt to develop. Um, there are theories that the reason that Egypt fell was because the Nile dried up for a few years. Um, this is the Nile Valley. Um, simultaneously, also, this, this, this is the Egyptian scale rule, um, this idea of calibration. Uh, another important thing is that the e Egyptians were very aware of geometry, they were very aware of calibration and the understanding that kind of measurement was a means of, of, of both um, um, understanding the society they lived in, constructing the society in, in which they live and controlling and regulating the society in which they lived. Here you can actually see the Nile Park, which we unfolded along the entirety, uh, along its full length. That's three meters going to full length. These, are the, these vertical lines shows the bands. The space above is exterior, the space below is interior. 
So the idea is that different programs begin to occupy um, um, spaces along the entirety of the site. But what the Nile Park does, similar to the Nile, the Nile itself, it is actually allows, whether inside, outside, um, within the museum, within the park, um, anywhere along it, within the space of the museum, it just allows all of these different programs to have a certain relationship to each other because they all eventually would, would actually touch the Nile at a certain point. point. So this effectively shows the programmatic structure as well as the spatial structure of the Nile and further on. And what we did is we took this entirety of the Nile and we squished it onto the site, which basically the three kilometers would just zip along here and move inside and outside, which would bring all of the, the kind of um, in, uh, spaces of the museum, both within the landscape and the museum together. And like the Nile Delta, that the lines actually begin to form fields, that the spaces between the lines can allow for the emergence of gardens, um, which is uh, when West Day came in to, to actually produce. You can even, this is actually a snapshot of a model that was built for the minister, and it was interesting that the first thing they actually put in was the Nile, because of what it does is allow them to understand the, the location of all the levels throughout the entirety of the model and regulate all the horizontal surfaces that go onto it. Zero, zero, zero. Uh, so this actually shows a geometrical diagram. The three pyramids are described by three lines that perform an arc. That's our museum. Simultaneously, if you actually mirror imaged it, we end up with the same three lines, the same arc on the reverse side. So we're thinking of flipping the light show from the, from the right side to the left side. Um, another thing which is well, quite interesting, because the project was so big, when we won the competition, um, we have about 120 people working on it now. There are about 12 teams all over the world. We were only three people, so when we went to visit Arab in London, we locked the door and we left, and there was nobody to answer the phone. So it was a very difficult project to do, and I think it was difficult for us because we were only three people, but it was also probably difficult for most firms because it's quite a big project. So we did, there was a few organizational structures that we implemented that we brought Bureau Happel and Arab into a joint venture, which allowed the client to feel very confident that the team can deliver because Arab has an absolutely enormous professional indemnity uh, insurance. So they're quite happy about that. But simultaneously, we actually had to develop a structure that allowed us to kind of coordinate the entire project. So the first thing we did was that so that the architect and everybody else would know where everything is. We put the this column grid not within the building, and similar to the integration of the Nile Park, we put the column grid over the entirety of the site. And that column grid is designed as a three-dimensional column grid. So the idea behind that would be that anybody, whether it's a service location, whether it's a road, whether it's a bench, whether it's a car park, everything is actually located on a, car, on a column grid. And what this, what this allows us to do is that anything within the project can be easily located and allows, once this, this, this drawing was sent out very early on, um, it was developed and sent out very early on so that all the 120 people in like whatever the six countries can actually work on one infrastructural system and everybody, and very, it's actually quite easy to spot an error very quickly or miscoordination. So you can see here the project, every car park space can actually be um, connected to the car parks. But by the way, on the lower hand side of the CEC, this is actually complete. One of the big changes is that we had to actually pull the conservation out because we had to conserve 100,000 artifacts before the museum opens. So you can see here the, the Nile Park, which is on the, uh, also on the column grid. The angles are on a one to two ratio. We also got rid of contours for the entirety of the site. We, we, we triangulated the whole site. What's nice about this is it allows us to actually deal with the surfaces of the entirety of the site. We, we can basically deal with an entire slope of probably a, a, a quarter of a mile with just three points rather than a whole series of infinite number of points that contours produce. And again, the, 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 the Nile Park is inscribed within those contour lines. Another way of understanding the building, we worked with Arab or Cecil Belmont and Francis Archer in something called the Advanced Geometry Unit in London. The, the, he's a mathematician, so he effectively developed the, the grid structure for the building. It's, if, it's kind of a, like a dimensionless building. You actually don't, you can remember all the dimensions of the building by remembering a row of numbers at the very bottom. 18, 18 are the digital streams, and they recur seven times. And the galleries are 30, 36, 36, 54, 54, 66. And all you do is take those numbers, multiply by 25, take 54, which is the unit, multiply by 25, and multiply the grid line. 
And that actually gives you the, the width of the building at any one point. So if you're walking anywhere in the building, all you have to know is the grid line, where you're standing, and you can do it in your head where, what the distance of the building is. So you can't use angles. It's all based on ratios. So here you can see the grays here are the digital streams, and they're all 18 units. And the bands are 30, 36, 36, 54, 54, 66. So if you have a column line 24, let's say here, it's 20, you want to know how wide this one is, you just take 18 times 25 times 24. That will give you the width of that digital stream. And likewise, if you're up here, if you're column line 10, digital stream is 10 times 18 times 25. So this is actually just showing the calibration of that surface. So if you zoom in, you can actually begin to see all the numbers that describe all the points. So it, it, if, like 8325 eight, eight, would be 25 times the grid line times um, uh, 18 units, and likewise over here. So they, you, you can see that they actually recur, 8325, 8325, A325, A325, and as you move up a column line, 8100, 8100, 8100, and so forth and so on. Uh, the other gem, the gardens. Um, this is uh, this is actually West State's project. This is the, this is all of the landscape that that was actually produced. We had these incredible fights, but at the end of the day, we learned so much about landscape. It was great. So here you can see the museum with the roof overhead, and now it actually reveals the space within. And now you can begin to see actually how the spaces all connect between inside, begin to merge with the landscape itself. And the whole idea of the gardens, as described by Westgate, is to actually produce this uh, condition between the desert and the Nile to produce this juxtaposition be between dry and green, which is as green as Ireland. And the different gardens, each with its unique identity, which should be juxtaposed very strongly to, to the desert landscape as well as to each other. The entrance piazza, have shut shut was, it, it's, a, it's a space of pure mon pharaonic monumentality. It's barren, it's cold, it's scaleless, and it's huge. And this is the, prime, the main entrance into the museum. To either side of this is the palm garden, which is uh, what they call this, uh, kind of inspired by palm fronds, which is the day palm of Egypt, the foldings within the landscape, to create these benches. These benches are quite in, uh, interesting because actually because of the shape, different forms within the gardens actually force people to move in different ways. So the benches actually allow people to uh, force people to promenade along these strips and rest at certain points. So each garden also produces a different way of moving through them. What's interesting about it is because the benches are sloped at an angle. If you look in one direction towards the pyramids, they're completely barren because you see the tops of the sides of the benches on concrete. And you look the other way, and it completely transforms into this Nile, uh, lush Nile landscape. So standing in the, at the base of the building, you immediately uh, recognize this juxtaposition of green and uh, desert. And here you can see a view from above showing the palm garden, the entrance courtyard as it moves towards the museum, and the palm garden on the other side. The lands of Egypt, which is the, uh, the space of Egypt as it was 4,000 years ago, showing the paddy fields. We tried to represent this, so we took the space at the lower level and we popped it to the other level. And in some ways, the desert itself formed a sort of vitrine which captured the space. So this space would actually uh, show the Egypt, the agricultural fields of Egypt as it was to three, 4,000 years ago. These are the fields themselves, and they would be juxtaposed within the vitrine of the desert to either side over in the desert plateau. The trees themselves would actually, the, the desire is that the date palms would grow to the level of the desert plateau, would not exceed the desert plateau, but because by nature the winds actually stop them from growing any higher. So you actually create this continuous plain over the lands of Egypt after, after the date palms have matured. The golden wall, they wanted a golden wall. So in the garden when the sun sets, you can see a golden wall. Um, Ramses. So when you first enter into, a, into the entrance courtyard, this is the point where people actually distribute. To the right is the conference center, to the left is the educational center, the workshops, as well as the grand stair, which brings you to the uppermost level. At the uppermost level of the grand stair, you see the, the pyramids itself. So, um, um, and this is also simultaneously where the galleries are located. This is a view from, from the upper, well, this is what you see at the upper level, some of the, from the pyramids, you can see the museum to the upper, point, upper part of the screen. 
So what would connect you from the lower level, which is the Nile Valley, which is with, to the upper level, which is the pyramids? That's the Grand Stair, and that's effectively the chronological gallery that would bring you from modernity into antiquity, which is when the pyramids were built. Here, an image showing the Grand Stair as it ascends up, bringing people to the uppermost level, and a tr series of travelators that would bring people, uh, the, the, the less able people, all the way to the, to, with the top. And these two spaces would basically merge as one space. This space is actually a shaded space. There's no air conditioning. The, the stiletto wall, which is actually what um, creates the space of the travelator, is created by the, the roof actually folding down as stalactites to the very bottom of, of the space. And it's a space where inside and outside begin to merge, where sometimes you're inside the stiletto wall and sometimes you come outside. The stair itself becomes a gallery, so that it becomes a chronological route or the pharaonic gallery where you can see um, uh, different exhibitions along the full way. Here is an image showing, this is a drawing actually by RFR who are doing this. Um, it actually begins to, to document the individual stalactites or stilettos that they get extracted and pulled down from the roof where we had to identify and, and number each of them. And what's interesting about this start to show here, you can begin to see the merging between inside and outside, is that these are actually folded surfaces, two folded, a 2D folded surfaces that's folded to create a 3D object. But the funny thing about that is that the trouble with the folded surfaces is that the surface itself, even though it's supposed to be thin, actually has a thickness. And at what point do you actually expose the thickness of this plane? So here's, here's a drawing showing the individual stilettos as they actually are extracted. The stiletto as we unfold them to understand the stone along them. Because when you actually fold them up, it looks like the, as if the stone is rectilinear. When you unfold them, they're all funny shaped. And actually the amount of structure that is needed, a thickness of probably about 600 millimeters or two feet that's used to support all the stone off the surface. These are plane one, plane two, and plane three. You wrap them up, you form the stiletto wall that connects to the ceiling. And you begin to have to describe every single point. So you actually produce zero thickness at all of these points when they come together. But what happens is you can never escape the fact that material has thickness. So even at the point where the two points touch each other and you want to put a little window in, you have to get a thickness. So you actually erode the corner of it. The permanent exhibit, which is the f at the very top, the galleries themselves, showing the galleries, which are thematic bands as well as the digital streams. Um, the, 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 this idea that as you look towards the pyramids, there's actually two sets of, of viewing. The gallery is formed through two sets of viewing um, um, mechanisms, I guess. One is the perspectival view, which is this kind of cone vision towards the pyramids, which actually shows the view across time through the entirety of the gallery, showing the full extent of the exhibits. And then you have this kind of view, which actually is a cross, which shows relationships in a period of time between different thematic blends. And it's the planar um, approach, to, uh, the planar way of viewing, which is actually more characteristic of Egyptian art, which uses um, layering to, to illustrate depth. So here you can begin to see the, the kind of trays themselves, which step down towards the north. Each tray goes down, also within the, the grand stair they go down, and these basically form a series of connections across time between different thematic bands. This shows the thematic bands through time, so standing here you can look from the, from the newest kingdom to the oldest kingdom across one theme. And together they basically combine to form the exhibition strategy, um, which is going out to tender now for, I mean, for, for people to submit. This is, we're probably going to have a master planner with a whole series of exhibition designers, and they will begin to mix. So here you can begin to see the different trays, the old kingdom, middle kingdom, new kingdom, late period. And where they overlap is the intermediate period. These are when the period, kingdoms collapse and um, um, new ones begin to, to emerge. These, so you can see the, 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 the trays themselves actually overlap to produce the intermediate space, which is a space of chaos, war, and the long and the short of it, in those periods, there's really no artifacts because all they were doing is fighting. So um, you, the, the spaces for the exhibition is quite small. So here you can see the transition between kingdoms, which is where all the ramps and the gal uh, ramps and as, well, as well as the stairs happen. But simultaneously, right below the ramps is the, the, the caves themselves. It actually shows the space of the intermediate, uh, intermediate kingdoms, uh, which is the minimal artifacts, but a lot of explanation. 
the servicing strategy. We work very closely with Bureau Halfold to, to produce the servicing strategy. As you know, the, the, the kind of desert condition is a very extreme. How do you basically produce a servicing environmental solution which actually fights the desert without um, basically taking a monster um, footprint, a carbon footprint? Uh, first of all, the galleries, we had to create digital streams. You had to service it. These are linear cores. Basically, the blue represents digital streams. They're all 18 units wide, and the idea is that they, they would be horizontal cores that would house all the services, stairs, IT, you know, bathrooms, toilets, blah, 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 so forth. And they would basically provide the, uh, the connection to the galleries themselves. The sequence, arrival sequence from an environmental point of view. The idea is that it's an onion diagram. So the extreme condition, desert condition, extreme, hot, how do you deal with it? The best way to deal with it is low tech, not high tech. The, they use a simple explanation. If you're, if you're in a tent, um, they will basically go into a church or a mosque in a very hot climate, and it's always cool regardless of how hot it is outside. So that's the idea that we're doing. Enclose everything in a concrete box, and you can regulate the temperature. But the other idea is not to air condition everything. I mean, why, why would you need to air, so when you, the idea is that it's the onion skin approach, that the amount of air condition actually begins to increase as the objects become more precious. So the outermost level, you just use shading. When you're on the grand stair, you use exhaust from the gallery. When you're within the galleries, you know, you use a kind of a low dispersion, low volume uh, um, uh, for cooling. And when you're actually within tut, you really cool it down. So effectively, your, your maximum um, energy is mostly on this side. Most of this is achieved through basically residual product of air conditioning within the gallery and sim simply shading. Here you can see the entrance courtyard, which is simply shaded. The gallery, the, the grand stair itself, which completely uses exhaust air from the galleries. And showing the exhaust air, is with, which is basically spewed from within the steps themselves down the, as, through a series of screens that create a series of vertexes that go up so that the, as you move up and up into the spaces, that the body basically begins to sense more and more cool as you go furthest into the Tutankhamun, which is where the coolest spaces are. So basically cool where you need it. Two facades enclose the, the museum, the translucent stone wall, as well as the super roof. The super roof and environmental horizon. Uh, metaphorically, it, it kind of resonates with the kind of foldings of the, of the sand dunes. Um, but what we had to do was, number one, it was, a, it was a triangular surface. But what we had to do was that we had to thicken it up into a prismatic plane. So this is actually, so sorry, into a prism. So this is actually has a depth. A uh, few reasons we had to do that. Number one, the museum actually is naturally lit. Um, so we had, that's one thing we had to, that, that's why I had this have a certain depth for clear story. Number two, that the depth allowed for the structure to span over the galleries without columns. And lastly, that you had to have a certain depth to basically enclose uh, the, the kind of necessary infrastructure for services into the roof. The roof, that's actually an Excel spreadsheet. The roof is actually not designed. There's a formula written by Arabs that draws the entire roof. So you can't say, I don't like this part of the roof. It doesn't look good. Can I change this a bit? You have to call um, Francis to rewrite the lifts routine. Um, so there's only certain things you can actually move on the roof. So the beauty of this is actually draws, the, the flexibility is determined. We designed the thing, it had to be stay along strict uh, guidelines, but it had a certain level of flexibility. Arab basically draws everything by uh, lisp routine down to, not down to the details, but pretty much all the steel work is drawn by a computer. And it basically produces miles and miles of drawings. So they have one programmer instead of 30 people drawing. Um, so here you can see the roof, how it forms this kind of cocoon. So the most important thing was not to go with a steel structure, but a concrete structure. So for example, if the, if the, if the electric power went out, the, the museum would pretty much stay within a stable temperature environment for at least 24, 36 hours before they had to get the power back on. If you had a steel roof, everything would overheat. So this roof, basically, this thick roof actually forms the environment with a stable environment through a very low-tech way of doing it. Very primitive, very low-tech, probably something done 4,000 years ago. And that's effectively the environmental strategy within, in extreme conditions. 
So just to go through the different layers that form the roof, it's called the mesh-mesh sandwich. To start with, the mesh basically takes the, full, the, the first hit from the solar radiation. So we use the winds that, to, to kind of um, brush the heat from under the mesh away. So that's why there's a space underneath the mesh. The next layer, you have to insulate the roof uh, so there's no transmission of the, uh, of the heat through it as little as possible. The concrete folds are produced not only to span the full gallery, but to create the spaces that allow for the different services to go in. The access platform, which accesses all the services and drainage structures. The acoustic baffles, which are behind the mesh below to absorb the sound given the nature of the, the large spaces. The air extract, as well as the smoke extract, are integrated into this. The, the lighting system is integrated, the drainage system is integrated, followed by a mesh to create the mesh mesh sandwich. Um, all of this forms this kind of fat roof that, that would basically protect the space of the inside. That's just the Bureau Hapo drawing showing every system overlaid on top of each other. It's still not coordinated after about a year and a half. Um, this, this is, they actually did quite a good job with the fire engineering. Um, you can actually see that the, what they did was the roof, the, the shape of those individual folds which allow the roof uh, to span over the galleries actually keeps the smoke from spreading because it actually contains it within each area. Before, and, and it, because we actually didn't, we went fire engineering for the gallery. You can't basically hit it with code. No code would allow it to do it. So everything was CFC modeled so th and basically the roof substantially helped it in order to spread the flames, I mean the smoke. So the space of the galleries and the fat roof that would cover the entirety of the galleries. And finally the translucent stone wall, the Sierpinski gasket stone wall. Um, it's actually called the Sierpinski gasket. Again, it was uh, uh, France, uh, Francis Archer the Arab actually um, uh, came up with this. It's a fractal system that uses a subdivision of two and it divides everything by half and it's binary going in and out based on zeros and ones which produce the entirety of this um, um, facade. This is actually a later model. When we showed the minister again, the first one was actually flat, kind of more like the kind of surface um, uh, a triangular, sir, a triangulated facade, and the minister said, um, your wall's too flat, get something going in and out. So I think Francis got these stone patterns to go in and out based on the binary logic. So here you can see the, the stone, uh, the translucent stone wall, which is about 20 stories high down to about two stories. Um, as, at, at this point, I think it's about 10 as you enter the main courtyard. The stone during the day, tr trouble with um, uh, onyx, it's very weak, so we had to go to extensive stone testing in order to test the structural strength of it to, to finalize on the seed and details. Same stone at night, the translucent quality. Uh, here you can be begin to see the binary nature of it. So basically, um, within each, it's like memory chips. Because it's binary, on each individual mega frame, there's 1,024 pieces, 2,048, 512, 256. Uh, simultaneously, because it's binary, each piece of stone actually moves in and out, in and out, in and out. So it's 800, 400, 200, 100, which effectively produces this in and out uh, depth pattern on the entire stone wall. Same stone and uh, wall at night. Um, again, a drawing by Arab, where we begin to isolate the 41 mega frames along the entirety of the project. The, 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 it's actually not a regular rhythm. The whole idea of the irregular rhythm, it actually corresponds to the programs inside of the museum. When there's certain programs that are quite big, they expand. When certain programs get, like smaller programs get crunched, they actually shrink up. So it actually produces this kind of funny rhythm. I, I think one of these is actually, that one is actually the edge of the gallery. And what's, what they begin to produce, that they produce this kind of banding structure where it basically intensifies and loosens up and intensifies and loosens up. And what the acoustics at Bureau Hapo did was quite interesting. They actually used those lines to put in the acoustic absorption. The trouble with 250 meters, the gallery in themselves are 24,000 square meters. They're five football pitches. They're 250 meters long. They're like a factory. So, so one of the things that we did was if you put the air diffusers and the acoustics in this format along this surface, what you begin to do is not just visually, acoustically and in terms of the environment, you get a kind of sensation or undulation in terms of sound and the kind of feeling of coolness and warmth on the body. And what that does is it actually creates a rhythm of the body as you move through it. And we, that was actually quite useful. And also simultaneously, the lighting in the clear story also follows that logic. So there's not a, it's not like a factory shed, which is continuous acoustic, 
um, um, lighting and everything. Basically, it undulates as it moves up and down, which responds to the translucent stone wall. So here you can see the depth pattern. This is the 800 depth pattern. This is the 600, the 400, the 200, and the 100. And they basically move in and out, in and out, in and out to form the full um, uh, circuit. This is one mega frame, uh, which is, uh, yeah, this is one of the 41 mega frames that was formed the translucent stone wall. Flip it upside down. You can see here the subdivision of the trans Sierpinski pattern, subdivide, 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 subdivide. And basically, what that does is it actually reduces our original design, which had over 250,000 different size panels to 41. Works very well. Good cost-cutting measure. The details that allows us to fix the panels, the wall is very heavy, so we ended up using shear plates to hold the entire structure. It's basically a bridge. It's massive in terms of its steel. Stone wall during the day, as it's illuminated at night. This is a few shots. This is the conservation center. You can see the pyramids 3,000 years, 4,000 years ago. They're installing Dow Corning, 100 mil insulation over the roof. This is the view of the conservation center, um, which is the rear. Um, they gave us six months to do 35,000, sorry, 39,000, 100,000 square feet, or 80,000 square feet. So we didn't have time to design the facade, so we shoved the entire building underground. Um, so we got it done six months, no problem. Um, and anything looks good with the two pyramids in the back. <laughs> and this is another thing that Francis actually found. If you actually take the, the, the museum itself, and this is the cliff face, and these are the three museums. If you take that line through the thing and you keep on continuing it, it goes through Dublin. Very odd coincidence. 